black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. And I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll, I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Going to be talking to uh, Matt. And Matt comes to us from North Carolina. He was driving up the side of this uh, hillside, and he, him and a friend of his ran right into one of these creatures. And then we'll talk to James. And James had an encounter a couple years back on a military base in Fort Knox. And he described seeing this thing. And at first he thought it was a soldier until he realized how big it was. And then we'll wrap up with Sean. And Sean comes to us from Georgia. He was out doing some work. I'll let him kind of explain the type of work he was doing. And some of the odd, strange things that happened uh, while they were out there. They were trying to get rid of this beetle that destroys trees. Um, And it's an area where I posted on the blog Christopher Tompkins. If you guys get a chance, uh, go back and read Christopher Tompkins. But he was actually a surveyor on the same job site, and he vanished. He was literally within 30 feet of someone. They were just talking to him, and they turn around, and he's gone. And I was going to do kind of a recreation of him disappearing, but then, you know, I I didn't want it to be in bad taste, so I kind of scrapped the idea. But if you get a chance, go back and read that blog. It's very fascinating. And I hope you guys enjoy the blog. I'm trying to post more interesting things up on the blog for you, sometimes Bigfoot-related, sometimes that's not. Um, You know, stuff I'm interested in. So I hope you guys enjoy some of the new blogs that I'll be posting. Uh, but let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Matt to the show. Matt, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here. And I know your encounter took place back in uh, 1995 in North Carolina. If you would, would you just kind of start from the beginning and kind of walk us into it? What What did you see? Uh, well, it was uh, July. It was, it was, of course, hot weather. And um, me and a friend... Uh, we're going to see another friend who lived on top of the mountain. We lived in a county called Wilkes. We decided to take the scenic route, which is uh, a back road, which uh, is paved at the bottom of the mountain. And as soon as you start up the uh, side of the mountain, it turns to gravel. It's, uh, it was hot, dry, and uh, the road was washboard. So we pretty much couldn't get up much speed you know, going up the mountain anyway. It was hot, and uh, we were both heavy cigarette smokers. We had the windows down, and um, we were just going up the side of the mountain, you know, slow. We came around this curve. The curve went back to the left, and um, saw what looked like a tall guy walking up, stepping up on the side of the road. The road to the right was a drop-off. It was like a small ravine. The road to the left of us was just a almost straight up and down embankment. And there was a house that set up further up the embankment on the left. Well, this looked what looked like to me looked like a guy walk, walking up mm-hmm. on the side of the road on the right. 
and it looked like some guy in a trench coat. At first, it was late evening, it was dusk, and, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of light out other than the headlights. And so I looked at uh, my friend Mike, and I said, well, who's the trench coat? Because, you know, why would there be some guy out here in the middle of nowhere in a trench coat coming walking up from the ravine onto the road? So I got to looking and realized it wasn't any guy in a trench coat. Whatever it was, it was about seven or eight feet tall. And the first thing I noticed was the it was it was sideways to us, and the um, so I looked at the inside of its right leg, and there was like something hanging from it in two or three places. And I got to looking, and it was it was like matted hair, like a a dog would have. You know, a dog gets wet and it gets matted hair, where it's big clumps of hair, and. Uh, and I was like, well, that's that's not a trench coat at all. That's not a guy whatsoever. And I got to looking, and uh, it had orange hair. It wasn't black or brown. It was orange, or at least in the headlights, it was orange. And as I looked up more up upwards at it, instead of just looking at its legs, it was very lean. There wasn't any fat on it. It was lean and muscular. Uh, had a flat face. And it didn't really have a cone head to it at all. It was more like a human's head, more rounded at least. Uh, and and I, one thing that really stood out to me is it had like a Mona Lisa smile on it. It had like a a grin. Its mouth was closed, but it had this kind of half grin on its face. And so I stopped the, the truck, and it stopped and just looked at us, and we looked at it. I noticed Mike in the seat beside me in the truck was going into bloody terror panic. He was kicking the, pushing against the floor back into the seat like, you know, he could get away from it and was starting to yell, you know, get out of here, go, go, go. It was closer to his side of the vehicle than it was mine. And uh, he was just in a panic. So I looked over at him to see what all the commotion with him was. By the time I looked back, it was running up the bank on the left side, which, I mean, this bank is so steep, I would have to grab on the uh, brush and stuff and pull myself up on the belly, my belly. There was no way I could do what it did. It just ran up this bank. So it took off. I got out of the vehicle, and about that time, we caught the smell of it, and it smelled like old rotten wood, old uh, wet wood rot and uh, a kind of a urine smell. It was just nasty. And uh, I could hear it crashing through the brush at the top of the bankment up the hill up there. I thought about going up there, but there's a house up there, and you could get shot for driving up their people's driveway for no reason. So um, we finally calmed down enough. I got back in the truck, and uh, we left. I came back the next day after work, and where it was been so hot and dry, I couldn't find any any sign of it. Uh, no footprints, um, just like it never even been there. A little further up the road, there's a uh, spring box for that house, and uh, it's right on the side of the road. And the uh, overflow on that thing's always running. So I assumed that he was probably in that area because there was a steady supply of water. There's not a whole lot of water on the side of the mountain there. You mentioned the uh, the orange, or do you think it was more of an auburn? And with your lights, it kind of gave that orange appearance. It, it could have been the lights. Um, it was a, it, it was a. If you've ever seen a, well, I know you've probably seen one, but an orangutan, that that color hair. That's the at least in the headlights. That's the way that hair looked. It didn't look brown or black whatsoever. It was very orange. Yeah, and I've heard many descriptions like that. And so you guys drive off. What did you get? What did you? What was the conversation like? What did you think you saw? <laughs> and that that was the conversation. Um, we went on to the friend's house we was going to, and uh, I mean, we were both excitedly telling them, you know, we just saw Bigfoot. We just saw Sasquatch. And he was like, uh, "Yeah, right." You know, just pretty much dismissed the whole thing. And pretty much anybody else I've mentioned it to after that. Um, 
would just dismiss us, you know, like, oh yeah, sure you did. That was a bear you saw. That's the, that's the big one. We, I still hear that today. I mentioned it to my sisters uh, a little while back. I said, you remember when I told you we saw Bigfoot, that Bigfoot? And they were like, no, but you saw a bear. You didn't, you didn't see that. And, um, Another side note to this is uh, ultimately um, uh, my wife, who I married, lived further up uh, the mountain range there, a little bit closer north towards Virginia. And uh, one of her friends, I mentioned it to them, and they said that uh, every spring um, they, uh, he comes down and raids their chicken house. They have to run him off with a gun. He he comes down the mountain. Uh, they say he, I guess, the, the particular one, and uh, will raid their chicken house. And they have to go out and fire guns to run him off. But he usually gets away with two or three chickens. But he said the uh, the Indians that live in the area and all the people that live there in that area call him Baytai. That that's the name the Indians gave him. Is that a name, or does it mean something? What's Baytai mean? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't really know. I just that's what he said that the Indians in the area that used to live there, there's they're not there now. Uh, called him Baytai, and then the uh, the people that live there now keep calling him that name as well. But he didn't know what the origin of it or the reason for that name was. Yeah, I get a lot of reports from that area of uh, it running around in the mountains. You know, I've had many different reports over the years from that area. Uh, I'm curious, what what did the face look like when you're looking at it? You mentioned the smile, but can you describe the face? Uh, it was uh, the hair came down the, the forehead, and it was a flat face like a human's. Uh, the head wasn't a cone, really. It was more rounded. The, it had hair, it came up, you know, like up its face from the bottom as well and down its forehead. And um, it had a, uh, just a, I won't say a leathery looking face around its eyes and nose. What part wasn't covered with hair. And the, uh, the hair was unkempt. It wasn't, uh, I've heard people say it looked like the hair was, um, you know, like it was stiff or firm. This one was just hanging everywhere. It had uh, matted hair on its legs. I noticed one arm, it had a clump of matted hair on it. It, it was looking pretty uh, rough as far as the, the hair. It was probably uh, seven or eight feet tall. There was no fat on, on the animal whatsoever. It was, it was very thin, lean, and muscular. Yeah, the other interesting part is you talk about it grinning. Was it showing teeth when it was what appeared to be smiling? No, it, no, it had its mouth closed. I don't know if you've ever seen the crazy Canadian guy, the Savonic uh, dot com. Uh, he's he's got all these videos he's filmed of uh, Sasquatch in Canada. Uh, I don't know what you think about him, but uh, the one video where it shows the uh, Sasquatch's head, or it's he's filming it. It, it, that one has a cone-shaped head, uh, whereas this one didn't. But the the half smile, the Mona Lisa smile on its face, is the same look this one had. It's just, if its mouth was closed, but it was almost like it was grinning. It was oh, I got gotcha. you. Kind of a Mona Lisa smile to it, and it didn't make any grunts. There was no sound. The only sound it made was where it was bra- smashing through the brush at the top of that embankment. Uh, it didn't growl, or if it did, we didn't hear it. Uh, I couldn't hear anything for um, my friend and his screaming panic beside me. Uh, probably anyway, if it had made a sound, but it was caught off guard, guard as bad as we were. I mean, it it uh, it walked up on that road. It wasn't expecting us to be there. Yeah, when you describe it going up the uh, the hillside too, I mean, they move like that. You know, they don't move like we move. Like you said, you know, you would have to grab bushes and you'd probably be halfway on your belly trying to get up that hillside. And, the, and this thing just ran up the, the hillside like it was nothing. Yeah, it was just boom, boom, and it was gone. It was up that hill in no time. There, there's no way. It would took me 15, 20 minutes minimum to crawl up that bankment and it was 
was going up there in just seconds. Let me ask you, what do you think that these things are? Uh, well, I'm a Bible-believing man, so I think they part of Genesis 6. They're offspring of uh, the Watchers. That's pretty much what I think of them, or they were created by them, one or the other. Yeah, it's interesting. You talk about its face. I know in the email you said um, it looked more human than it did ape. And was it mainly the yeah. expressions, or was it the features of the face? Uh, the shape, the shape of the head. Like I said, it didn't have the big cone like some of them do. It was more, more of a of a human head, and the the eyes to me looked more human and the um, smile. I mean, it did have some ape feature to it, but it just overall, the the head, the face, just seemed to be a little more human than uh, than I would have thought. I mean, it, it didn't have the ape protruding slope face or whatever that you would call it. Um, it was more of just a flat face like a human. It didn't have any kind of, there was nothing remarkable about it other than it was covered in, in hair more than the humans would be. Yeah, it's a fascinating account. I imagine it'll stick with you for a while. Yeah, it's, uh, I've never forgotten it. Um, it's just, it's finally nice to have somewhere to tell the story without being ridiculed. Yeah, I, def I definitely believe you, Matt. I mean, I I've had so many reports throughout the years from that area. I know exactly where you're at. I get a lot of reports from that uh, from that area. Well, if anything else happens in the future, let me know, will you? And I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. I'll do it. Welcome, uh, James, to the show. James, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much, Wes, for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here. And I know uh, you had a very interesting encounter on a base. Uh, if you would, would you mind kind of giving us as much information as you want, kind of tell us what you're doing, and just walk us into what happened? Sure, Wes. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily it was an encounter because the subject and I did not have any interaction whatsoever. I just witnessed i had a, a a sighting of this creature but uh at this time uh, i had been in the army I, I joined the active duty army uh about april of 94 um i had been in the national guard prior to that and i was attending college and after my first semester that wasn't the thing i wanted to do so i went active duty and at this particular time, this is my very second unit. I was there at Fort Knox. And uh, the entire brigade went out to uh, Western Kentucky. It wasn't on a actual, I, went, I, I don't know if it was actual military insulation because it was between Fort Knox and Fort Campbell. But uh, evidently, a, a National Guard did a lot of training out in this particular area. And uh, we were out there for a month. People from Washington, D.C. were there uh, taking a look at us about our training and everything. But um, at this particular moment, uh, my battle buddy and I, I was, a, I was a PFC at the time. My battle buddy was a specialist. And uh, we were told, you know, go ahead and go and take showers. So on our way, we, we were driving HETs, cargo HETs, a 10-ton truck. And... Um, we parked in near the assembly area of coming into this training area. And it was not very far from the entrance into this uh, training area. And right there near the entrance was uh, a building where uh, we could go take showers and so forth. And about a hundred yards from there was the staging area and the back end of the staging area, they had lined up all the connexes. Uh, where we put our supplies and stuff in. And behind the connexes was a small area where a Humvee could easily drive up and down. And then there was a hill. Now, this road uh, that we were on, it came up uh, past the building. 
and up to that assembly area and staging area, and then it split off. Across the road, across this trail, was the ammo point fuel point. There was a, a street light there at the, the fuel point, and then at the uh, end of the connexes, uh, right there next to the road, uh, the trail, was another street light. Well, where I, we were parked, uh, it was approximately about 75 yards, a little bit more than that, from the end of the uh, connexes, because we weren't far from the fuel point. So my battle buddy and told me, go ahead and go take my shower first. And he outranked me. And so I hadn't been in the Army long, so I went and took my shower. And when I came back to the, the truck, it was starting to get dark. And my battle buddy, you know, he went off, and he was already at the, at, the few, at the shower point taking a shower, and I was sitting in the driver's seat. And uh, while I was sitting there, my back was against the door, and I could look out the passenger side door across the road, across the staging area and at the connexes at the end. And I was just sitting there and uh, the light was on. It illuminated a good area of there, but didn't illuminate up the hill very far. And uh, it got the, that end of the connexes pretty good. And from out of the shadow off the hill came this figure. Now I saw this person and you have to think this is an entire brigade out here in this training area so you know we, we had all different kinds of people there there were calf scouts out there and there was some infantry and uh this figure comes out of the shadows i'm thinking well there's somebody lost on nighttime land nav and the the figure was walking around there and, and their head was kind of down looking down to the ground and the way they were walking was like they were looking for something I continued to watch this this figure, and I started just noticing some things about it that were strange. I started noticing, one, this person wasn't carrying a weapon. They weren't wearing battle rattle because, I mean, you can tell the outline of the battle rattle, but the one significant thing of the equipment that we carry is the gas mask or the pro mask. And it really, it's like a purse. It really sticks out there. And then I noticed that, you know, their, their BDUs weren't bloused into their boots. And this individual is walking. I'm just sitting there just watching this and not really grasping what I'm looking at. And then it proceeded to walk behind the connexes. And the top of the head, with its head still down, looking, the top of the head came to the top of the connex. Now, mind you, I'm six foot three. So with a with a pair of combat boots on, put another half inch or so on there. And I can if I stood into a Connex, there's another two inches. And if I reached up and stood on my toes, I could grab the top of that Connex, barely. Well, about a couple of weeks later, or not a couple of weeks, it was about a week or so later, you know, I was working down there at the fuel point ammo point. And I took the liberty of going over there to look. And uh, the area is really compact. It was gravel. It popped back down pretty hard. Uh, you could barely make out a Humvee uh, track. And mind you, Humvee is a couple tons there. So there was no footprints, nothing. And I could clearly see that uh, to the back end of that connex is, you know, it just went off towards a ravine. And uh, at that other end of the connex, is, I, I remember that the lights from the building barely lit up that area. And I never recall seeing the individual walking out from behind there. And it took me a little while to finally come to realization I saw what I saw. I, I witnessed a, a Sasquatch walk off that hill. Yeah, it's interesting too. The uh, the conics that you described. What, what would you say? They're about seven, seven and a half feet up. Oh no, they're they're pretty tall. They're they're almost eight feet up in the air. So the, these are conics that you will see normally on the back of a, a semi. They're they're tall. So me being, you know, I can reach over seven feet easy. And so, what do you think this thing was? About eight feet. You said its head was almost even with it. Yeah, when it was, its head was looking down. So 
it had to be over eight feet tall. And what did you think at the time, James? Were, I mean, were, were you just trying to process everything? or Because uh, there's yeah, no way this uh, could have been a person. I mean, unless the tallest basketball no. player ever showed up. You know what I mean? Right. And, and I remember, too, my CO was taller than me. You know, whenever I went and talked to him, I had to look up. So, uh, you know, uh, I was I was kind of, uh, I'm not going to say I was in shock, but I was just confused and bewildered. And I'm like, you know, first I was thinking, who's this knucklehead out here doing land nav, you know, because he didn't have a map. He didn't, you know, everything you would see someone doing land nav with, he didn't have battle rattle, didn't have a weapon, nothing. And I'm like, man, this guy's lost. And then I'm just watching and watching. I'm like, this, I'm, I can't believe what I'm seeing. And it, it took me a little while to really come to the conclusion that I saw what I saw. Yeah, I would imagine. Do you think it went off into the ravine because it never came back out? Did it? It kind of walked behind that. Thing? It could have. It could have very well went off in the ravine or walked up the hill at the other end where there was barely any light. Yeah, it's so bizarre, man. I, I as you know, we're talking off the air. I've talked to a lot of guys on military bases, and they always have mm-hmm. some encounter. It's like the one I was telling you when they were doing winter survival, and uh, he yeah. ran into one, and then he he put up his rifle to it. And as he's sitting there, you know, he's just going in his training. His training's kicking in. But then he stops and goes, I don't have any live ammo. I just basically can make a a large sound. Um, You hear a lot of this stuff. Did you tell anyone about this? At first, I didn't. You know, uh, I was 24 at the time, you know, immature, new in the Army pretty much still. Uh, So I I kept it for myself for many years. And... um, I, I believe I, I eventually I told my dad and uh, I told some friends. I got friends. You know, I have a master's of divinity. I have friends in, in the field of theology and biblical studies and stuff. And uh, we talk about Genesis and whatnot. But uh, I told them my story. Some of them don't believe me, but I've come to the point. I'm 47 now. I don't care if people believe me or not. You know. What do you think that Sasquatch is? Because I would imagine you took time to actually start looking into this and thinking about this incident over the years. What do you think that Sasquatch is, James? Well, my my background with this subject matter dates back when I was eight or nine years old. When I was a little kid, my father took us to the library, and I remember coming back, he had a couple of books, I know at least one book about Sasquatch, Bigfoot. And I remember seeing the Leonard Nimoy uh, in search of him, like many of your listeners and your guests on your show have testified to. But um, I've always, looking at the Patty film, uh, I just assume, in, in my opinion, that uh, a Sasquatch is a, another type of uh, primate, like our great apes, you know, the gorilla, the orangutan, the chimpanzee. Um, I, don't, I don't think they're anything else. They're just another form, but have, been, have adapted better to the environment. Um, where they're able to walk up a little bit more upright. Uh, their, their feet are more apt to walk in the terrain that they have to walk in. But then you think again, you know, the mountain gorilla, it's a pretty much the same kind of terrain, a lot of hills, um, very tough terrain. So their feet are still, you know, the, the fifth appendage or the big toe is off to the side, more like a hand. But evidently, Sasquatch has been able to adapt and uh, formulate its uh, behaviors to its environment. Yeah, that's interesting. I always laugh when uh, people say, oh, there's no way the government's covering this up. And, you know, (laughs) your encounter was pretty mild, but I've had a lot of encounters on bases. And, you know, Mm -hmm. if the government wants to pass off your, you know, housewife, your hunter, your cop, Mm -hmm. your this— a little harder to pass it off when it's happening on your military bases and you're trying to, you know, Correct. I always laugh. I tell people, you're telling me that they don't know that these things are out there. I mean, I've had MPs on before and I've talked to them privately yeah. that have seen these things. There's a base out in California and uh, mm-hmm. while a long time ago I had an MP on. He said these things run across the base all the time and anymore mm-hmm. they just look the other way. They're like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, and it's, I can imagine Fort Lewis is that way yeah. a lot. Yeah, a lot from Fort Lewis. Absolutely. Yeah. 
My uh, the first report I ever heard about a Bigfoot on military installation is Fort Gordon. Uh, guy, a civilian, worked on that installation, and it was at a range. It was at the back end of the range and walked into one. Uh, I never, I never yeah. thought. When I read that one, I started looking up some other areas. Like I went to basic training in Fort Leonard Wood, and there, there are reports there too. And I kind of like, you know, oh my gosh, you know. I went to the field out there during basic training and spent several nights out there. <laughs> and I'm just, um, I'm just kind of amazed at uh, their easy access. But yet again, like I told you today on our first phone call, military installations, you have your garrison area where everybody lives and works constantly. But uh, like Fort Knox, it was in, it's in four different counties. And there's a lot of places out there. People can get lost easy. So uh, things can be hidden out there. And, you know, the other thing I, I, I laugh about people, you know, I've never seen anything in the woods, you know, why don't we have a body? And my thing is, you know, I, I grew up, uh, my, my family comes from West Virginia. I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia Beach. And I would visit my grandparents in the summer. And when I was a teenager, I'd go up in the hills and the woods walking around all the time. And then here where I live in Kentucky, you know, there's a national parks. So I've been to those places. I walk up in the woods often. I see deer, you know, when I'm up there in the woods. But the only time I ever see skunks, raccoons, possums, stuff like that are dead on the side of the road. I don't, I never see them in the woods. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a mystery, man. It's definitely a mystery. Mm-hmm. And it, like I said, it just amazes me that, it happens more on military bases than you would anticipate. Just like you were saying with yes. Fort Knox, I mean, uh, up here at Fort Lewis, you know, in Washington State, uh, you're talking thousands of acres of land. I mean, yes, you can see the whole base and it's nothing but forest before you actually come to the base entrance. And I know the area well. Right. And when you say you can get right. lost out there, absolutely, man, you can get lost out there on that yeah. base. Um, yeah. But it's fascinating, and I really appreciate you coming forward and sharing what happened to you, James. Thank you again. Thank you, Wes, for having me. Welcome, uh, Sean, to the show. Sean, thanks for coming on. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. And I know your encounter took place in Georgia. And we were talking about Christopher Tompkins and him disappearing, him being part of a survey crew uh, that disappeared. And you were in that area. If you would, would you just kind of start from the beginning and tell us about this area? What, what were you doing? And kind of walk us into everything that happened. Uh, I was working for a a company that the reason we were there, we were doing Mojays and it was for a tract of land that Mead paper owned. Um, not all of their trees on their property do they turn into paper pulp. Uh, A lot of it, they sell off to construction or, you know, furniture companies and things like that. And they'd been having a lot of tree loss due to, um, pine beetles. They can kill off trees pretty quickly, especially when, you know, you have just forests full of, you know, replanted and regrown pine trees. There's a lot of food for them. So we got hired to go in and do that with the crew. Um, And if you want me to explain a little bit about what a moje is, I can. Um, I don't know if you want me to do that or not. Yeah, you can. Feel free. Uh, What a a moje is, you take a a drill and you path into the tree about one-twelfth of its uh, diameter equal spacing about six times around the tree and you can inject anything from iron if it has chlorosis problems uh which is iron deficiency uh to insecticides and fungicides pretty much uh we were obviously going to be using an insecticide um but laws are really particular about mojays you can't leave the capsules laying on the ground you can't leave them in the trees you have to clean up you know relatively quickly after after each application Um, so it was about three days before the job was going to start. And I drove out from the office to meet the uh, mead contact who was going to 
he was pretty much the point of contact for the meat company. And he had sent me a, uh, a text message saying he was running about 10 minutes late. So I pulled off the paved road, turned on to the dirt logging road. Um, and I was waiting about halfway down. And the tree line starts about 12 feet on either side of the road. We were going to be doing areas on both sides of the road. The road itself is maybe about 1.2, 1.3 miles total. I was about halfway down. And uh, it it wasn't dark. It was about maybe 520-ish, but it was dark enough in the wood area for the headlights to automatically turn on in in our trucks. So I decided I would drive down because I know it opens up into a a turnaround spot where logging trucks would load up and, you know, things like that. That's where we were going to be parked. Um, So I decided to drive on down because it opened up more. It was, you know, a bigger clearing. And I wanted to do that. So when I saw him coming, I could just pull and and meet him and our driver's sides could be next to each other. So we wouldn't have to get out because I didn't want to go walking around, you know, this close to dark in an area I've never been in really. Um, and to be honest, I don't know how to explain it, but while I was sitting halfway down that road, I just, I started to not feel, I didn't, I didn't really feel right. I don't want to say I was scared or nervous or anything, but I guess the, the best feeling I can compare it to is if you're watching a movie, a scary movie, and you know, a jump scare is about to happen. You just know it's about to happen. So you're, you're kind of getting ready for it. That's kind of how I felt. Um, just really anxious, I guess. Uh, so I drove down, turned, and uh, just backed up down that way. And the bed of my truck was backed up against a mound that they had cleared this area off. They pushed the dirt and, you know, grass root particles up in the mounds towards the backside of this clearing here. And I'll just describe it. Imagine you're a clock. The clearing itself is the clock. My truck is at about 530 with the front end of my truck facing 12 o'clock, which would be where that dirt road is. It comes into the the clearing. Uh, So my driver's side was, you know, anything over from from 6 o'clock on the clock towards the driver's side. And then from about 5 o'clock going up to 12 would be on the passenger side. I heard a really loud snap. And my first thought was it must be, you know, a rotten rotten pine tree limb or something from where these beetles have been causing this damage. I didn't really pay much mind to it, but I heard what best can be described as someone who was running on a hard compacted floor, but they had oversized shoes on. So it was like plop, 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 plop. And it was loud. So I put my arm on the passenger seat and, uh, you know, turned around and looked through the rear view mirror and over top of this mound, I could see 60% of this tall pine tree swaying back and forth. And it was the only one that was doing it because these trees are pretty much in rows. Um, You know, and you'd be able to see them easily if they they all were being blown or or what have you. Uh, So I didn't really feel comfortable with that. Um, As I I told you earlier, I had a couple things in Utah that I experienced when I was going to college out there. I'm originally from Alabama, but I didn't have anything to where I could – definitively say, okay, I know a Bigfoot exists because of what I saw in Utah. So at this point, I didn't really know anything, never experienced anything um, that would be definitive. And all of a sudden, I heard, I mean, it was clear as day. It was three whoops. It was whoop, 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 like that. A long one, kind of a middle one, and then a super short one. And it was about I don't know, it was off towards the driver's side at about maybe 9 o'clock over in that area. And I just kind of rolled my window down more because I was having a cigarette. Uh, rolled it all the way down. And this was mid late February, around in that time. Uh, and all of a sudden, I just got – the truck started getting pelted with – I mean, they were – it wasn't like rapid fire or anything, but consistently every couple of seconds, tiny – Either they were acorns or little bits of gravel, like um, tiny, tiny pieces that you would use on a gravel road is what it sounded like. Just hitting the bed of the truck, dink, dink, 
about that time, I, it was getting really uncomfortable for me. Uh, this guy hadn't showed up yet. Uh, that stuff was happening. And I heard a shriek off behind me from where I thought the rocks were coming from. And it was really close. And I've never heard, I mean, I'll do the best I can at it. I hope no one makes fun of me for it. But it sounded like a, like that, except it was really loud and it was piercing and very throaty, not guttural, but throaty. So I cranked the truck up. My my lights were already on. I was just listening to the radio and I saw movement from where the whoops came from over in that area. They weren't right at the tree line, but it was still dusk enough to see, to see dark figure moving. Uh, I can't tell you how tall it was, you know, but I, I started to leave. And when I got down the road to where it turns back into a paved road, uh, my mead guy was, was waiting for me there. So we stopped and talked a little bit. And he, you know, mid- midway through the conversation, he said, Hey, I apologize. You know, I really hate coming down this area. And, you know, I knew what just happened to me. So I asked him, you know, what was up with it. And that's when he told me about Chris Tompkins. I'd never heard the story before. I was, you know, out in Utah going to college at the time and uh, just didn't, it wasn't really national news, I guess. I didn't know anything about it. This was in 2011. And he told me that story and I told him what I just heard back there. And he told me that one time in the past when he was coming down the same road, he saw a large animal. I'm quoting him, large animal. It strided across the road on two feet, two legs. And as soon as it made it into the tree line, it jumped down on all fours like like you would imagine just a four-legged animal doing, going from two to four, leaping, and then just strolled off into the forest. And he didn't, he didn't really... I don't want to say forest. It was it's woods, uh, and that was the only experience he told me about. But um, come back, you know, the first we start three days later. There's really nothing that goes on um, for the first three days. Um, the survey crew uh, they they had, they would leave their boxes of tree ribbons where they're going to mark the trees for us to do. Uh, down in the clearing, because that's where we all would park. They would come and ask, have we been messing with their ribbons? And we would, you know, we didn't have any reason to mess with their ribbons. Uh, we don't need them. Uh, and I'll just get to the, the really startling part, I guess. And that was when one day, it was when they asked us if we had taken their boxes of ribbons, and we told them no, and they had only marked off about 10, 15 trees. And we had a four-team crew doing it. And they had to go back, and they said they would come back later in the day to finish marking the trees for us to come in in the morning because we'd try to get there about 7.30. It was me and one other guy because I sent the other people home, the other technicians who would do the, the mojays, because we didn't need the whole crew. We didn't need that many man hours being wasted in this one area. They could go and take care of uh, other projects. You know, We also did residential lawn care, fertilizer, insecticides, things like that, tree and shrub services for residential houses um this company is in all 50 states if you're in a city that's of marginal size you're you're gonna you'd be able to find it in your phone book or on google so it was me and one other guy and we were going to finish knocking out the trees that we had left uh it was it was getting pretty close to time for us to get off anyway we were maybe maybe 400 yards from the clearing uh where it cleared out in there and all of a sudden, we started hearing those whoops again and, and that shriek. And my partner asked me if I knew what it was, and I, I really did not know. But I said, I think it's time for us to clean up and start getting out of here. So we're picking up these Moje capsules off the ground because you don't want the product in them, getting in the water supply or ground supply or animals, picking them up and using them for nests or, or trinkets or whatever they, they would do with them. There's, like I said, there's state laws that govern how you're supposed to pick them up and dispose of them. So we're cleaning these things up and hear that shriek again that I did earlier. And it sounded like it was maybe half a football field away. We start pacing it back to the truck. It was me and him rode together. And all of a sudden I hear a like a whistle sound and it comes 
I mean, it's super close to me. If you know what these mojets look like, you'll know that one end of them gets pierced. So there's a hole in it where that the fluid can flow into the tree. What I was hearing was one of these things being thrown really hard through the air. I don't want to say it was thrown at us because I know that they, you know, they might be able to hit us if they wanted to, I'm sure. But it was distinctively one of these things that we were putting in the trees that they were throwing at us. So we booked it back to the truck. We sat there. We heard some vocalizations. But the only tree knock that we heard was when we were leaving, as the truck had passed where the clearing is. And that's where, as we were driving away, I mean, our windows were down, obviously, because what was happening was absolutely crazy. Uh, we heard three distinct wood knocks as we left. That was mine and his experience there. Um, and we had a few other things happen, like I told you in the email. They're, they're not nearly as dramatic or, or scary as that. And what what you got to understand is, I'd never experienced anything like this before. I thought a bunch of things was going on. Maybe somebody was screwing with us. Um, obviously, the thought of, well, maybe maybe this Bigfoot thing is real, and we're pretty much in some danger here. Because this area is no more than three miles from where, where Chris was working on his survey crew. You know, every couple of days, the survey guys that were, were marking this area for us, uh, well, let me let me stop there. After this happened with with me and Jim, that was that was his name. Uh, we would find the tree ribbons that they marked. They used blue ribbons, is what they used. Uh, we would find those torn off the trees that were to be treated, um, ones that we hadn't drilled yet into, but we were we were being paid to do. Um, those ribbons were just scattered around. One day in the morning, it was, I mean, we got there, like I said, about 7.30, and a bundle of them were wrapped together and just, they were sat in the middle of the clearing. And we thought the survey guys were messing with us. They thought we were messing with them. So we finally had a sit down and we told them we hadn't touched any of those ribbons. And, you know, we asked them if they were messing with us. And everybody concluded that everybody was on the up and up and nobody was messing with one another. Towards the end of the, the, the job, we noticed the trees that we had been treating, and this had been maybe three weeks now since the first ones we started. And it wasn't quite a month yet. Not all of them, but a good number of them had been pushed completely over is the best way to describe it. They weren't cut down with an axe or a saw or a chainsaw. They were, they were either pushed or pulled over because they all had breaks about the same length up. I mean, there were some, some deviations, but most of them, I mean, they, they, would, they were broke, like if somebody pushed them. And these weren't small pine trees. They were a good seven, eight-inch diameter pine trees that had been completely pushed and was only ones that we had our plugs in, the, the ones that we had tapped to inject with this, this beetle killer. Uh, those were the only ones. And like I said, it wasn't all of them, but it was a good number of them. And we finished about 70% of the job and our, my need contact. He said, uh, you know, we did a great job, all things considered. It sure was a weird job. Sometimes that happens. And I asked him what they were going to plan on doing. If we were going to, you know, I wanted to get another sale. If we could come back in a few months and finish up the job, that other 30%. And he said that they're just going to let the land sit for a while. And I don't want that to sound nefarious or anything like they knew what was going on because it's pretty, t it's common to let trees that have been treated sit before you do anything with them. Um, but you know, with what he had told me before, I'm sure his survey guys had told him, you know, these, these tree guys are fucking with our, our, uh, our ribbons here. Uh, but it, eventually they stopped using the uh, ribbons and they went to blue spray paint. And uh, that's when, that's when, the trees that had already been ribboned had, had them all pulled off. We started seeing some trees pushed over. We had a couple of drills that we would go to lunch. We'd leave our equipment. Uh, we'd all, you know, drive in one or two trucks instead of the three that four that we arrived in. And we had a couple of drills get broken on separate days, not on the same day. And you got to use a, a lock key to get these drill bits out. And I'm talking bent drill bits like, 
not completely like you'd see an Iron Man, you know, bend a big piece of rebar. But I mean, they were bent, and I know I couldn't do it, but it, it took some strength to do that. Yeah, it's strange. You know, it's um, it's really strange. What what did you think was going on at the time? I mean, it's like one strange occurrence after another, and you guys are working in this area. And I've heard strange stories like this from guys um, in in the lumber industry. Uh, they'll tell me a lot of strange stuff, uh, very identical to what you're saying. But what did you think was going on at the time, Sean? My first thought, I mean, my first thought was it was a person who was, especially with me being there, I, I, that was the first time I had been in this area. And it was, I mean, I wish I could take a picture and show you what it looks like right now here. Because, I mean, it's a little bit later, but it was also in February, so it might be similar comparable daylight, but, um, it was dark like it is now, but in the woods. And my first thought was, you know, if anybody's ever watched Scooby-Doo, we all learned early on that the real monsters are people just wearing masks. So I thought it was somebody in the woods, you know, messing with me. Uh, don't know how they knew I was going to be down there, but that's what I thought. Because, like I said, it was, it was either acorns or tiny, tiny little rocks being pelted at the bed of the truck. And, you know, then that whooping, I can make a pretty good whoop. I don't know how good I would have been, you know, in 2011, never trying it before, trying to mimic it. But, I mean, it was a whoop. But that shriek was throaty. It was very piercing. And... The only thing, I mean, I didn't even think about it, but later on, the only thing looking back that would be able to make that maybe would be an owl or something like that. But I've heard shriek owls, and it was the, it was a 120, it had to be 120 at least pound shriek owl to make that kind of noise. It had to be the biggest bird ever, and I just don't think that's what it was. After he told me what he had seen down the road, you know, I, I don't just, you know, I don't believe everything I hear, but that's when I started thinking, okay, well, we were out, you know, camping up in, uh, on North Ogden Canyon road. And I heard some of these noises and people back then said, Oh, that's a Sasquatch. I didn't necessarily believe it, but I'd heard it. And then I started to replay things that happened a couple of years in the past. And a part of me didn't want to believe that Bigfoot could live down here. You know, he always, you hear those stories from uh, the Cascades and up in Alaska and Canada and parts of Utah, not down at the base end of the Appalachian Trail. I mean, we've got a bunch of trees, a bunch of hills, a bunch of water sources, I guess, but it's not really at altitude like you normally hear. So I really didn't know what to think, I guess. Um, and really looking back, that's the scariest part, not knowing exactly what's going on or having an inkling of it. Can I ask you, and I want to be careful on, I hope this comes across the right way because someone died, and so I kind of want to walk in eggshells around this subject, but what do you think happened to Christopher Thompson, Tompkins? Because he just, like, vanished. I mean, literally just, he was there one second, and then he was gone. There's really, it's like he just vanished into thin air. Well, what do you think actually happened to him? Well, I mean... If you look at the facts of the case, he was on a survey crew, uh, just like these guys who were surveying, you know, laying out these, these tree lines for us to do. Um, and, I mean, I, I saw them work firsthand. Uh, they, I mean, it, they stay 30, 50 feet apart from each other, and they, they, have, they would just, you know, they walk in a straight lines. So That's what they do. Um, we could see them working when we were working on the trees. They could look over and see us. I mean, Chris completely disappeared. No one heard a sound of commotion, him yelling. A few off in the woods, they found one of his boots uh, by, by a barbed wire fence. I think they, I believe it was 12 cents they found, and I believe a pin. Uh, and then a couple years later, they found his other boot on this uh, rural like landowner. He had a lake. They found one of his boots there. And if you keep going, draw a straight line from where he went, the, the, the fence, the lake, 
all the way back to these woods. It's all within a, a, a pretty straight line, and it leads all the way back to this area that we were we were doing those jays in. Uh, and like I said, it's, it couldn't have been more than three miles. It just could, can't be. Uh, really close area. And in order for something, I mean, either he wanted to disappear, which his mom and family, I've never never spoken to them ever, but from the things that, you know, they've said in newspaper articles and things like that, he had a very level, level-headed person, um, wasn't into drugs, didn't have criminal history or anything like that. And he was just a good guy. Um, I don't think he would want to disappear. He had a pretty good paying job. Uh, surveyors make, I mean, you know, he's not a doctor or anything, but it's a pretty good job for this area. And so that only leaves him being abducted by something. And I don't mean abducted in the term of like alien sense, but something big knew exactly what to do to make sure a grown man didn't make a single sound and there was no commotion with him being drug off. And he had to have been drug off because they would not have been able to find the 12 cents. Like imagine if you were wearing blue jeans, work jeans, you got your big boots on, and how are contents in your pocket going to be dropped on the ground? You're going to have to be picked up by your legs or drugged by your legs through the barbed wire fence. Uh, something strong had to do that, and they had to have known exactly what to do, and they had to be extremely quick at it because, I mean, searchers were on the scene. They realized he was gone and, and notified people. I believe it was within an hour. I know it was at 1 p.m. is when they called people uh, just by, you know, doing my own research into it. So it was pretty quick. People were on scene, and like I said, they, they couldn't find a drag trail. Like, well, yeah, I mean, we're talking, I believe he went missing in late January, I believe. Uh, and so, you know, it was, it was wintertime down south. We don't have snow, but we do have a bunch of pine trees. And I mean, there's pine trees everywhere. There's pine needles everywhere. There's last year's season of pine needles on the ground and you seasons before that. You'd be able to tell, I mean, if I gave you a 50-pound bag of rice and told you to drag it through the woods, we'd be able to immediately tell that you drug a bag of rice through the woods. And they could not, they could not see where somebody had been drug off, uh, which just blows my mind. Yeah, it's a sad case. It's a bizarre case. But, um, and my heart goes out to the family, too. You know, I mean, it's... Um, I want to be careful and not say Sasquatch did it because, again, Chris is dead. Um, but uh, he, it's just bizarre, man. It's a bizarre case. And I know you and I talked about some other cases off the air. I want to ask you, though, Sean, what, what do you think Sasquatch is? I know you've been looking into it now since this encounter. What, what would you say? What, what do you think Sasquatch is? Well, I, I, I firmly believe that it is a flesh and blood animal just like you know, just like we are, or anything else that is living on this planet. I don't believe that it's uh, a supernatural entity or a spiritual entity. And I know, I know a lot of people do, and you know, I don't want to poo-poo on, on what they believe, but I didn't experience anything like that, anything supernatural. I didn't, and then I can go into more specifics if you want, but for me, I didn't see the entire time we were there, including the, the first time that I had anything happen, I never experienced the eye glow or eye shine. Not once. Um, and we were using some lights. I mean, especially that, that first time. Um, didn't, didn't see any eye shine. And the night that me and Jim had that, the plug, the, the injector capsule, thrown at us and heard the whistling and all when we got in the truck is we we drove we were parked again like towards where that mound would be towards the back end of it and as we were driving off we saw Pekin uh right next to where the the clearing turns into the to the road to get out of there we saw Pekin back i mean it was bobbing to our left so it was coming around on its right side of the tree bobbing and looking at us and the headlights bam I mean, hit, hit the top of the hit the top of the head, and 
no eye shine whatsoever at all. And so I decided, you know, I wanted to look into that. Eye shine is caused by a membrane called the tapetum lucidum. And only certain species of animals have that. Your cats have that. They tend to glow green, but some can grow into the yellows and oranges. Wolves and ursarines, the canines and ursarines, they share a common ancestor back, back in the past. Theirs tend to glow the same color, more oranges, red. Same with coyotes, a lot of red eyes. The color of that eye shine is directly correlated to the amount of zinc that are in the, the pigmentation receptors. Um, I, I can't remember if it's more or less zinc determines which color is which, but I know the levels of zinc determine eye, eye shine. Primates, humans, the only eye shine we have is when we take pictures. I'm sure you've heard of uh, you know red eye. That happens because the pigmentation of our irises reflect red. Uh, but the mass of our eye, where the sclera is, does not reflect light. Interestingly, no other great primate, great apes, the gorillas, bonobos, chimpanzees, none of them have eye shine because none of them are nocturnal animals. Typically, your nocturnal animals are the ones who have this membrane. And what, how it works is when our eyes receive light, it's absorbed immediately and transmitted to our brain so we can get images and, and that's how our vision works. Animals with this membrane, the light gets recirculated around in the eye, which allows them to see better in the dark. It doesn't get absorbed immediately. So there's only a very few species of primates that are nocturnal. Um, those are your lemurs, your eye eyes, uh, your bush babies. They all are from Central and South America. They're all very tiny compared to you know chimpanzee and us and Bigfoot. They experience eye shine. They all have oversized eyes. In my belief, I think that just like everything else, there's probably different species of, of Bigfoots. There would have to be because that's how genetic drift uh, works. I mean, that's how, that's, how, that's how evolution works. Isolated tribes of animals are going to evolve to have different traits. Um, but from what I saw, I saw absolutely no eye shine. Um, it was they didn't create their own light, and they were not reflecting the light that I was shining. Similarly to if you were in the woods and someone, well, let's put it some a different way. If you were looking into the woods and there was a person and you shined a light, his eye, you're not going to notice an eye shine like if it was a cat or a wolf or a coyote. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So it would appear the same way, and that's exactly what what I saw. I saw primate eyes that fit every example of what we have in the fossil record and current living record for primates. I saw no eye shine. Um, now that doesn't mean that you know it hasn't evolved to to be a nocturnal uh, large primate because that's very possible that. You know, these are smart animals. They've gone this long without being 100% detected and hunted off, which I'm sure is something that they are concerned about. So they're, you know, they've clearly evolved in different ways, but I do not yeah. believe that they're supernatural and create their own light. So you think uh, it's more or, of a, or can, so you think it's more of a non-human primate? Yeah. I mean, you know, human, we're, we're primates too. Uh, genetically speaking, we're, we're just as much primate as a chimpanzee is, but um, we're just evolutionarily different. So I, I believe that they're 100% in the same family that we are, the primates, but they, they must have evolved to have uh, different traits based on the areas that they live in, uh, which, which is what you would expect to see anyway. Um, but for me, I didn't, I didn't experience anything supernatural. I had no phasing, no telepathy or... Uh, mind speak or you know uh, anything like that i i did not experience that at all and that leads me to conclude that they must be flesh and blood just like you know it's like our house cats and everything else they're, they're just animals uh and that leads them to being dangerous uh you know all animals are dangerous and i don't you know there's a few times where you know i was extremely concerned but we didn't have anything violent like savage happen to us while we were there. I didn't, you know, but yeah, looking back on it, I always wonder if, if our guys were in any kind of danger, uh, 
because we always tried to leave together. I mean, we, you know, it wasn't like, all right, we'll see you later, Bob. Uh, you know, see you back at the office. Now we, we all loaded our stuff up together and we all left together every night. We all went to lunch together. We didn't leave anybody out there just, just by themselves, but yeah, looking back general. on it and, and knowing what I know now about the Chris case, uh, I mean, these tree, I mean, it would take a lot to push, push pine tree over, um, you know, and we were treating trees that there, there was no point for us to drill into a tree and treat it if it was already dead. It's a waste of our needs money. It's a waste of our time. So we treated trees that had damage that weren't dead. We knew that our chemicals would kill it and save the tree. And they were pushing over trees that we had treated, which means they were, mod- I mean, they were, they were moderately healthy trees. And there's no way. I mean, there's no way that four of us we couldn't hook a we couldn't hook a chain around it and pull pull one of these trees over with with our trucks. I, I firmly believe that we could not have done that. Yeah, it's still unnerving though. You know, when you're out on a job site like that, and just weird things are happening to you, and then when you read about what happened to Chris, and here you guys are in the same area, and you know trees are getting pushed over, things are being thrown at you, you're hearing vocalizations. Uh, it's obviously keeping an eye on you if it's peeking around a tree as you're pulling out. Uh, it's it's very unnerving. It's very unnerving, and it makes me question what happened to Chris. It really does. It's a great encounter, and I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing it, Sean. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and share what happened to you in this area. No problem. I appreciate you having me on. It was, uh, like I told you, I haven't. It it's a part of my life that I wanted to talk about because – um, you know, it, it was time to, to get it off my chest, what I had experienced, because I think that we could do a lot of good researching these, these animals. And, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not saying we should capture them or anything like that, but, but we need to research them because people need to know what's really going on. People need to know how dangerous they are. They need to know, you know, just, the, just the idea that we, we have people, uh, who have such a wide range of beliefs about what these are, what they're capable of, what their intentions are. Uh, it would be good for everybody if we knew or could research further. This is their traits. This is their habits. This is what they want. This is what they can do. Uh, this is how they evolved. <clears throat> that way we can steer clear of them if we need to. Uh, people can be safer when they go out and enjoy the woods. Um, and hopefully we can you know, implement conservation tactics that would preserve their habitats as well. Yeah, I hear you. There's so much to it. You know, there's so much to it. And until it comes out that these things are actually out there, you know, until someone acknowledges the fact that they're out there, um, I don't think we'll get to any of those points. But I understand where you're coming from on it. And I appreciate you coming on again, man. Yeah, thank you. Anytime. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is Wes at SasquatchChronicles.com. Hope everyone has a great weekend. I will see you guys next time. Something that quite time.